know I love doing these videos with you talking about your American art auctions. I know you do, because I do too. Well, I have to tell you, you and I have talked about this at great length in the last couple of weeks, about the fact that there's something about this particular auction that I think you're more, I don't want to say more passionate about, because I don't want to disregard those that have come before, but yeah. there is something particularly joyful about this one, and it's certainly yeah. infectious when you talk about this particular auction. So talk to me a little bit about how it is you came to put this particular sale together. I knew it was time to go in sort of a different direction with our category, with American Art at Heritage, because we've established ourselves as leaders in the fields of Western art and illustration art. The marketplace understands that. But we have such a strong platform that I felt that it was time with other houses sort of focusing on other categories. I thought it was the perfect time now to sort of puff our chest a little and show all of our capabilities and right. really promote American art from every genre at Heritage. You know, not only Western and illustration, but modernism and black art and regionalism, women artists, Hudson River School, presidential portraits, which are all so equally important in the canons of American art history. But traditionally at Heritage, I'll say, in the past 20 years or so, you haven't seen as much of it here. But it's time. I mean, we have the audience. We're getting the prices. Let's show everybody every aspect of American art in these sales. So how has it changed since you've been here? I mean, in terms of putting them together, in terms of as the category grows, as sales grow, as Lion Decker sells for a staggeringly enormous amount of money, four point million dollars. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's... It's crazy. I sort of wonder what that does to your expectations and the client collector's expectations about the pieces we offer. That's an interesting question, and, and that goes to who's buying yeah. at Heritage. And I, that is one area that I've seen change exponentially since I joined the company nine years ago, at least in American art, because there were a lot of clients that I've worked with when I worked at another house before coming here that were clear, clearly passionate about American art. They were looking to acquire really good pieces, but they didn't understand Heritage as a broker of blue chip museum quality American art outside of illustration art. And with the art worlds, with you know the snooty New York art worlds. <laughs> <laughs> Those are your people you're talking Those about. Those are my people. They're, I'm very comfortable with these people, but they are, I would say, cautious or leery of anything new. You know, the, the whole process of auction is 250 years old if you go back to when you know Christie's and Sotheby's were founded in the 1760s. So masterworks of American artists have been handled for many years, but because up until maybe 15 years ago, people perceived heritage as more of a collectibles house, a coin house, comics, sports, things like that, and we're still really big in those categories, they didn't know if what we were offering was what we said it was. Seeing a fabulous Hudson River School painter painting, uh, Jervis Mackenzie, let's use that as an example. Since who's in this auction? Who's in this auction, who's a beautiful Hudson River School painter. He's sort of an esoteric Hudson River School artist. Not everybody knows him as well as they know Frederick Church and Thomas Cole and sort of, you know, Albert Bierstadt, artists like that. But with certain artists like these that are a little more esoteric, a lot of the New York and the Northeast auction crowd would not even turn their focus to heritage even if we had really wonderful works to sell. But what's happened over the past decade or so is that with each passing auction, we're setting new auction records, we're seeing new buyers. We are seeing you know, some of the biggest collectors in the world, in America certainly, who collect American art, who are getting much more comfortable with heritage as a broker. They're trusting our information, they're trusting our images, which are the best in the business. So then even if a client can't see the work in person, if right. it's in Texas, they feel fully comfortable spending six figures on a Hudson River School painting, which is tricky because with the older a painting, the more important the condition is, right? So if they're not able to see the work in the past, they would say, you know, don't worry, we'll just go somewhere else for, to fill this niche. But that's all changing because of our online platform, because of how we present material, and because of our team. I have to say, we have one of the best teams in the business, if not the best team in the business. And we have specialists in New York, and in Chicago, Palm Beach, San Francisco, LA, Dallas, Tennessee, so uh, Ohio. So they're able to connect with 
our elite team of specialists wherever they need us. Another interesting thing I'll say that I sort of love about Heritage also is that we have become sort of the, the auction house to offer the bespoke experience. So we are not afraid to get on a plane with a painting if one of our good clients in Philadelphia wants to see a work on their wall. We'll do that for them. We try to be very nimble and right. make sure that the clients get the experience they want in order to make this decision and make this big investment to buy something in the six or seven figure range. So therefore, we're getting bigger prices, we're setting records, and as a result, we're seeing consignments come in at a higher quality point. And that's just gonna continue to grow. I would love to see where we are in uh, 20 years from now. I'll probably still be here on this chair talking to you. Well, you're wildly optimistic. <laughs> I'll be a lot grayer, but. Uh, I will be a lot <laughs> something. Yeah, right. um, what I wanted to ask you about was the fact that you've talked about this auction and a few before this as offering sort of a syllabus yeah. of American art. And I think an auction that offers Rembrandt Peel all the way to Maurice Sendak mm -hmm. is kind of an extraordinary journey through the history of American art. Absolutely. And I sort of wonder, as a scholar, as a lover of this, not just as a seller of this, what you've learned about American art, especially when you look at this auction. Because, you know, when you can see so many disparate artists all brought under one umbrella, right? you know, some people might think that that's kind of forcing all of it. Oh, they're American, therefore that is a thing. But I do think that you could sort of trace the evolution of Rembrandt Peel, for instance, to Lion Decker and Rockwell. Absolutely. You can trace a lot of these folks through the journey that you've provided in this auction catalog. That's right. And obviously when someone opens up the catalog, visually, even if you don't know anything about art, you understand inherently that there's a big difference between a Rembrandt Peel portrait and a Sendak done in the 80s. And that's not all that different than other categories. You know, in post-war and contemporary art, someone buying a, a Cecily Brown is not going to be the same person who buys a John Curran. You right. know, abstraction, color fields, uh, schools of art, that's all different, and it does bring in different buyers. But in American art, I do believe firmly that, and we've discussed this before, that American art very closely relates to, is, runs parallel to American history. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, everything we sell in our category is considered Americana, right? So, right. you know, the, the Rembrandt Peel portrait we have in the sale done in 1855. It's a replica that Peel made himself. He was so successful with the original that he painted, that, that's hanging now in DC. And he was so obsessed with creating the portrait of Washington that everybody would recognize, and they do recognize this work. It's, it's, everybody recognizes it. Even my, my father recognized it. He's like, oh, I know that one, <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't happen that often. But there is something um, very familiar about what we sell in American art, whether it's a Rembrandt Peel portrait or a Sendak, all of that is, is in our brain, it's in our patchwork of, of our entire lives, all of us in America. So even though there will be a very different buyer, maybe it'll be crossover, but right. usually a different buyer for a Sendak and a Peel, they speak to each other when they hang in a room together. I, I really do feel that. Well, I mean, you talk about the fact, and you've talked about this quite frequently, about the fact that you find all of these pieces sort of either separately or together to be comforting in a way because they are the story of this country, they are representative yeah. of the best artists this country has produced, some of the most overlooked perhaps, some Absolutely. of the most revolutionary in the yes. case of Gertrude Abercrombie. Oh. I know that's one of your favorites in the I'm auction. I'm obsessed. Talk I'm a little obsessed bit about it. that one. <laughs> so, I mean, you know I love any women artist, anything. So, you know, any woman in a man's world who succeeds is very exciting to me, and as a mother of daughters, that it, it, incur it, it sparks something in me that makes me feel up to any challenge. I know that's just a little hokey. Maybe I go a little too, I'm a little dramatic, so maybe no, not everybody not has that reaction to a Gertrude Abercrombie, but it does for me. Jane Peterson, we have a few Jane Petersons in the sale. Right. I have the same reaction to those. Marguerite Zorak, uh, George O'Keefe, any of them. I get that similar feel of seeing a woman you know, like Alice Neal, they talked about, a lot about that at the Met Metropolitan Retrospective this past year about a woman in a man's world where they weren't necessarily appreciated in their own lifetime, but we are seeing them and appreciating them now today. And Abercrombie was 
acknowledged in her lifetime. I mean, the work we have, the lonely house in this sale. It's just right, done for the WPA. It was done for the WPA, so you know they would only approach a, 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 an esteemed and right, the best of the best, the really. best of the best. So I love that they went to a woman to paint this picture. And Gertrude Abercrombie is a regionalist. She's a modernist. She sort of straddles a couple different right. worlds. And I love American regionalism. I mean, Grant Wood is oh, maybe my favorite. Grant Wood. Really? Yes. I love Grant Wood. One of my I favorite. Mean, I didn't mean to ask it in such a high voice. I know, I'm a little surprised. Really? That, that was a strong yeah, reaction. Sorry, but right. yes, I do love Grant Wood. He, he didn't live very long, so his great yeah. pictures were in a very small period of time. And he also sort of forged his own path. Uh, Grant Wood, American Gothic, I think even people in, give me a, Bali, people in Bali may understand and recognize sure. American Gothic. So, well, there's a universal artists, appeal. In there's all a universal of appeal. Work. And this portrait, at first glance, feels dark. But Talk about the Abercrombie. The Abercrombie. Yes. I encourage all of you, anyone watching this, anyone watching this, to go to our website, to ha.com, to read the essay that we have written by the scholar on Abercrombie that explains this work so beautifully because this work was painted in 1938. It was a commission, mm -hmm. and it was painted when Abercrombie was 30 years old. And she was one of those women, like all women who were artists at that time, that were being given a little bit of free reign to do their thing, but also being asked to sort of stay within the confines of how a woman should act. You know, and Gertrude Abercrombie wanted to be wild. You know, if, if Thomas Hart Benton can smoke and drink, why can't she? Right. She wanted to do what, what the men did. And because she wasn't able to, she was scolded and told time and time again that she could not. She had to act like a lady. She felt very oppressed and very, she felt claustrophobic. And I love this. This portrait, this painting, is actually, in a way, a self-portrait. If you look at it, there are three doors, but two of those doors don't lead anywhere, and there's no steps to them. And there's a sort of weird, supernatural almost background behind her. It asks a lot of questions. It feels very surreal. And that is how she wanted to project what she was feeling on the inside. I love that. You know, another piece that I'm, I'm really sort of smitten with in this auction, and it's not just because Lion Decker sells well at Heritage. We certainly own the world auction record for Lion Decker. But I, I, I think the one that is sort of the centerpiece of the auction, the Saturday Evening Post cover, yeah. the boy trying on his first pair of big boy pants. Yes. It is such a universal piece. It is. It is, I think, of all the Lion Deckers that I've seen come through here, it might be the one that speaks most to me, having perhaps been in that situation myself. And having some, a son who did it. Right, having a son. Getting the bar mitzvah suit. It's very interesting to me. Lion Decker obviously had, be, you know, rose to prominence doing a lot of fashion ads, the arrow collar man, and so forth. But this seems to me sort of subverting all of the things that he did in his fashion work, in as much as that it's the mother shedding the tear. It's, talk, it's the pain of watching a child slip away into adulthood. Right. I mean, there's a lot of text and subtext in there that is. piece. There is, and it's so beautifully painted also. You're right. It is, it, as far as line deckers go, it's a pretty complex composition. Yeah. One it's might even think it's very Rockwellian. Well, think, I mean, this was done in the 30s. Rockwell was already on the scene. Right. So line decker, you know, from what I've read, line decker did not feel as competitive with Rockwell as Rockwell felt with line decker. Right. Line decker was older. But I can't help but wonder if line decker was, in fact, inspired and influenced by I Rockwell. I feel like it's, Rock, it's, it's Lion Decker saying to Rockwell, I can do Rockwell better than Rockwell. I can do this too, yeah. exactly. And I, I love this. It comes from a great collection in the Midwest. It's in beautiful condition. It has been lovingly cared for for over 50 years. And it, it sort of gripped me. I saw it across the room and it had star quality to it. It did, it sort of made my heart stop. So I knew that we had to bring it in for sale. And I also wanted to keep our audience excited. I wanted to keep them on their toes. I don't want them to feel that our American offerings are formulaic. So we've already proven a point. We've already shown them great single child, you know, football hero, football hero. Uh, New Year's babies, you know, a narrative with one person or two people where there's a lot left to the imagination. And playing hooky is in this auction, which very much is representative of that side of Lion Decker's work. Yes, exactly. And that's adorable. And that was painted the same year as Football Hero. Right. And that's a good story. I've got to, sh we've got to share yeah, that yeah. story in a moment. But this one, I wanted our audience to see a little bit more, a different side of Line Decker. And notice 
you know, different areas, their, their collections can sort of veer in different directions because we don't only sell property to get big prices, to make our consigners happy, to make our buyers happy. We want to advise our, our buyers. We want to offer sort of concierge service and help them mold really beautiful collections that will take them and their families into the next generation of collecting. So I want a lot of our line decker buyers and even our Rockwell buyers to see this picture and understand line decker in sort of a different light. And perhaps integrate this work into their collections and sort of fill a, a niche that they don't have already. So I'm really excited about this picture. There's already interest in the work and bidding just opened a few days ago, so that's pretty cool. In fact, it's, we had it on view in New York last week. We had a preview in our New York office. A lot of my babies are in Chicago right now. I'm heading there to meet them for a preview there. Yeah, that's why that stuff, by the way, is not behind us because it's tr kind of traveling the country. It is the traveling the country, yes. They're on the, the yes, the world tour. Well, the world tour, the New York Chicago tour. Right. Exactly. So you get to see that's some other things. That's your world, all right. It's not Texas, but we have to make sure all of our clients <laughs> How old see is the, the material. Dent Richardson Plano triangle. <laughs> yes, but you're coming to New York next week, so that's exciting. But I did want to bring this line decker for that specific reason, and one of the point I wanted to make, going back earlier to what you were saying about the diversity of the sale, I felt it was extraordinarily important to show our audience, to show the American art world that we still hold a traditional signature brick and mortar auction of American art that covers everything. Because nothing stays the same, right? And we're seeing a lot of evolution at other houses where they are taking certain works from the American sale and putting them into the Impressionist and Modern sale, right. the Americana sale, the Modern and Contemporary sale. So all of these important modernists like Milton Avery and Fairfield Porter are moving into the uh, modern sales. And I understand why other houses are doing that. They're trying to bring in other clients. But at the same time, I'm a purist. I like to see American art under one umbrella. And as an American auction house, it makes perfect sense for us to keep it here and, and, and show our audience that we are traditional and American venue. We will always sell American art and elevate it as what it is, as American art and nothing else. Because American art is beautiful in its own right. You don't have to make it into something else. And that's what I plan to do for the next God knows how many years at Heritage. Tell folks the playing hooky story. So this is really good. As we've discussed, with often with major important works of illustration, the backstory is equally as riveting as the painting right. itself. So this painting was in Leindecker's home in New Rochelle. And Leindecker notoriously did not have a will. He did not do much planning with what would happen after he was gone. And his sister was involved with sort of cleaning out the house and moving on and getting rid of everything. And this painting was going to be thrown out. And the seller's father was tasked with being on the cleanout crew. And he saw this painting by the garbage and he loved the painting and he said, is this really gonna be thrown out? And he was told, yes, it's, it's garbage, we don't need it. And he asked if he could have it. And they said, sure, it's garbage. <laughs> so he took it home and and here it is. I mean, it, it was dirty. We had it cleaned. It came to life. It came to life. I, I wish I could show you before and after photos, but it just literally, it's this one little boy who looks so, he reminds me of my four-year-old son who clearly would do something like this and skip school to go, uh, go <laughs> play. fishing. Yes, he would do anything naughty. Put his books on the dock, throw a hundred percent. And it reminds me of my son, but that's what's beautiful about Golden Age Illustration because it it does remind all of us of childhood and of mischief and of happiness and of right. stolen moments of innocence. So you really see that look on his face. It popped out once we had the painting lightly cleaned. So I feel almost as if the painting was reborn. You know, it's inter interesting to me that there can be a story like that in this auction. And there are pieces here that have been displayed in the Smithsonian. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, yeah. true, that's pieces that are acknowledged as yes. great pieces Absolutely. that are acknowledged as true parts of the American story. That's right. You always can tell greatness by what curators select mm -hmm. for their exhibitions. They have lots of choices. And there was a great Civil War show that was at the Met, it was at the Smithsonian, and our Jervis McEntee was in that show. Right. This painting oh, is everything that's good with the Hudson River School to me. I chased this one hard. I love this yeah. painting. It's in the original frame. It's unlined. This painting was done in 1862. It's unlined. I don't know if you can understand how amazing that sure. is, Robert. That 
gets me out of bed every morning. So this painting has the condition, the rarity, because McEntee, these great sort of masterworks, you do not find very often. I've only seen a handful in my life before this. So, and it's got good provenance, the exhibition history, it's been in a great show. It's only been in two collections since it was painted in 1862. I find that extraordinary. I know, I know. And I think that's, you know, as I was going through the catalog, a lot of these pieces have been with their owners for a very, very long period of time. I know, and that's not a coincidence because we want to bring fresh to market finds. We are all over the country trying to find these paintings because we do have a responsibility now. If we're gonna elevate American art to a new level at Heritage, we have got to present to our, our buyers the best of the best, and that includes being fresh to the market. So I feel as if we are presenting these works for the first time to many people other than those who have seen it in these shows. So the McEntee is this beautiful, very poetic scene of a little boy, two boys, by mm -hmm. a fire. And one is in sort of red, one is in sort of blue. They're in this very peaceful landscape, sort of wilderness behind them. Very rugged, rustic scene. Very rugged. It, you know, it, it conjures up the concept of manifest destiny, which is, of course, crucial to the Hudson River School. Sure. Hard scrabble. Exactly. So this work was done while the Civil War was going on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these Hudson River School painters, they were artists, they were poets, they were peaceful men, you know. And of course, the Civil War was, was painful and, and traumatic for so many people, but this was McEntee's gift to the world. This was his representation of, let's call a ceasefire, let's end this and move on as one country united moving forward. So these two boys represent the North and the South. And could they really sit at this beautiful bonfire in the middle of our beautiful country and just find commonality so we can move forward and stop, instead of killing each other and finding how we're different? Which isn't that different than what we're going through today. We were talking about, it's, what, I wanted to ask you about the McEntee and go back to the Abercrombie for a second. Because certainly we talk about the subtext of these particular pieces. Was it known when they were painted? Was it known the first time they were displayed what they were truly saying? Did people look at the McEntee and go, that's the artist plaint for peace? Is that Abercrombie saying, screw you to the establishment, I can be a woman just as well as you can be a man? Good question. No one's ever asked me that before. You're such, you should be in journalism. But yes, I do believe that their messages were clear when they were executed. You know, we obviously, it was a different time, so we didn't have social media and news outlets and, you know, covering everything. But the, the McEntee was exhibited right around the time it was painted. And I'm sure that the message was not lost on its audience. With Abercrombie as well, I think that, listen, she was a pretty outspoken person, so I can only imagine... <laughs> <laughs> She's my kind of girl. I sort of wish that we could sit down and ha we'd probably never be able to get a word in the two of us together, but no. I do sort of wish that I could sit down and talk to her more about this painting. But I do believe that people understood that she was trying to get her message out, let yeah. her voice be heard. I'm just fascinated. I, I, I find, I have to say, the Abercrombie is the one that's in some ways in the, the Lion Decker have really stuck with me. Yeah, I'd love of, to take that Abercrombie home. It's very special. Yeah, it really is. I'm already jealous of whoever buys it. Let's talk about the Tooker yes. and the Tempera, because uh, there's a piece, in here, the Tempera piece, there's a piece entirely in Crayola, that we can talk about in a little bit as well. Right. I mean, it is really pushing the envelope, but the t yeah, Tooker did what, one or two pieces a year? Because that's of it, yep. His, I mean, he really worked in the old master egg Tempera style. That's, that's astonishing. Astonishing, I know. And so he layered glazes, similar a bit to Maxwell Parrish in that way. Really? So that, you know, he would paint, it would dry, he would, he, would, he would varnish it. He would paint, dry, varnish. And as a result, the painting has this almost lacquer, enamel-like quality to the surface. Also and very otherworldly. Very much so. It feels very fantastical and almost timeless. You know, this could be a 16th century scene and it could be a 21st century scene. And it's bizarre. It's sort of out there. That's what I love about Tooker. And Tooker was one of a small group called the Magic Realists. Right. I'm obsessed with them. When I go to Fire Islands and I'm on the beach, I turn around and all I see are images of paintings by Paul Cadmus, Tooker, Jared French, their sisters. They're all this sort of wild group that was also involved with 
Lincoln Kirstein, the modern art dance movement in New York. So they were all very progressive. They were very overtly gay. They did not hide who they were, which was really revolutionary at the time. Right. I love that they led with their own true identities and did not try to conform to what dealers wanted them to do. They did not try to conform to personally how people wanted them to be perceived. And their art very much uh, is parallel to how they, they live their lives. And Tooker, great works by Tooker do not come up very often. I think I've only handled, this might be my third ever. Really? Yes. Wow. I know. So I'm very excited. What about Ernie Barnes? Have you handled a lot of Ernie Barnes? Not until recently, but we sold a really great Ernie Barnes last season. Yes. Really great Ernie Barnes that sold for about $250,000. Ernie Barnes is having a moment. I mean, I love Pool Hall, but Sugar Shack is obviously like one of the great modern American pieces. Oh, yeah. It's oh, used yeah. in good times. It's Absolutely. Used in Marvin Gaye used it for an album in 1976. That's right. I yeah. Mean, I mean, he was part of that whole scene. Yes. And a former football player. And a former football player, which is amazing, which helps you understand how he under, understood anatomy and was able to still show these football players right. in this I, great I, lyrical I way. I've always wondered how his professional football career, of which it was a lengthy and celebrated career, impacted his artwork. I mean, this is a guy who was chided during team practice. Yes. While a Bronco for actually... Absolutely. Uh, well, look, George Bellows was a uh, minor league baseball player, and right. that helped inform how he painted his, his boxing scenes. We could do a whole presentation on artists that were inspired by their previous employment. That would be great. Wouldn't that be great? I know. We should I'd like to get the that. sports guys in here to talk about the... Uh, and we could swap. I'll talk about the baseballs. They can talk about the art. <laughs> That'll be great. Man, people would pay big money to see that video. <laughs> At least in-house. That's right. That's right. But, but this Ernie Barnes is fabulous. I mean, <clears throat> one Barnes recently sold for over half a million dollars. This is a moment for Ernie Barnes, and this is a museum quality work. As soon as it went up on our website, a few institutions reached out really? about it. Yeah, because he's a really important modernist, important African American, and a lot of black artists for the very long time were marginalized. Absolutely. I mean, when, when Barnes went to go find black artists, he was told repeatedly by docents at museums, your people don't express themselves that way. Isn't that outrageous? Well, it's nauseating. Sure, I know. It's appalling. It's infuriating. Appalling. But appalling. again, that's not to be surprised given the time in which you grew up either. No. No, you're right. And I agree 100%. And you could say that with women artists also. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was one time when the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a few decades ago, did a, a show on black art. The reviews were terrible <laughs> because they said, this doesn't look like a Van Gogh. This doesn't look like what we're used to seeing. And it, who says it has to? You know, so I love artists that challenge, you know, the, the writers, the critics, the curators of what is considered important art. And the history of slavery and emancipation and all of these artists sort of, you know, coming into their own. Bill Trailer, who was an artist who was a freed slave who never learned how to write. He had to copy someone's signature of the, how they taught him how to write his name to put on his own works of art. That is extraordinary to me. So it's a folk drawing. Of course it's not going to look like a Van Gogh. Of course it's not. So you've got to look at it in its own context. That's what I love about artists like Ernie Barnes and Norman Lewis, who was working with Rothko, yet for the longest time, up until a few years ago, he was not elevated. He, he wasn't right. even reaching the seven-figure mark until very recently. He's an amazing artist. You could say the same thing for Ernie Barnes. I mean, why is he not reaching the same price point as Thomas Hart Benton? Well, look, you uh, had compared him to El Greco in some way when we were talking uh, last week. And I remember as a kid when the El Greco exhibition came through Dallas, lines around the block at the museum, and I keep thinking, I like Ernie Barnes's work much better than El Greco's. Did you really think so? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I know. I get it. I love it, too, because it's American, and it's American subject. Right. It's, it, relatable. It's, it's a, relatable. It's relatable. It's a scene you could see on any street corner in any American city at any moment. Exactly. So that resonates with our yeah. client base. It resonates with, with a lot of people. I'd like to take that one home, too. You know what I also think resonates in this auction? The Sendex. You know, obviously we love, we adore, we revere, we cherish where the wild things are. And to see that piece is just, it brings a great smile to your face. But I've noticed in this auction there's a lot of artwork from children's books, from children's stories. Yes. And I've often wondered if that is because of your love an appreciation for these artists and their work, or is it because, as a mother of three children, 
you, you know, really see it, know it, feel it, live with it, you know? The answer is yes yeah. to both. I've read these books when I was a little girl. I read them to my children now. I remember my grandmother reading them to me. I mean, some of my greatest childhood memories revolve around experiences with these books and loved ones. I think everybody feels that way. And we did so well with our Sendak in the last sale. We set a new auction record mm -hmm. for the work that was uh, done for the Art Institute of Chicago. Right. And, and this after, is for the 25th anniversary. Exactly. It's a really cover. meaningful cover. It's a really well done cover. It's got Max at the center popping out of a cake. You don't see Max in a lot of these Where the Wild Things Are That's illustrations. Right. So it's got the whole cast of characters, which is great. And after our last sale, I had this moment with, with my own brain, because I can never shut it off. And I was thinking, OK, what does this tell us now? That the, our, our, the Bemelmans, the little Bemelmans that we sold in our last sale, the estimate was, I think, 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. It sold for over 70. The, the Sendak, the estimate was 1 to 150. It sold for over 170 and set a new record. The art world loves it. People are appreciating it as a legitimate area, a genre within American art. And I want to push the envelope in what is perceived as American art. Yeah. We've got the audience. We're getting the results. We've got eyes on us. We're getting picked up by, you know, we're getting great media on our sales and uh, great PR. And I want people to take the American art tradition and take it further and see what's being done today. Because where else do these artists fall? They don't go into contemporary art. It doesn't belong there. You know, the Von Alsberg, extraordinary drawing. I don't know if That's you've seen it. That's the crayon piece. Yes. Blows your mind that, that a human being drafted this. It's extraordinary. I mean, this is the guy who created Polar Express and Jumanji and has won awards and Sendak himself has referred to Van Alsberg as the greatest living illustrator besides himself. So, <laughs> besides himself. So we need to carry on that tradition. Our audience wants to see it. They need to see it. I do believe very strongly that children's book illustration is a strong, permanent part subcategory of the Heritage American Art Sale. You know, we do very well with historical at Heritage. We do very well with books and manuscripts at Heritage. Mm -hmm. And collectibles. So why not? And I actually went even a step further and put the Sendak on the cover of our catalog. And it's not, I know some people would be like, why? Why, would, did you, why? why is that on the cover instead of Appeal? Well, the Appeal is the back cover, so don't worry. We did not slight George. But I want people to see something that makes them smile when they get this catalog. And this sale is being uh, held in May, and it's spring, and it's rebirth, and it's flowers, and it's sunshine. And when you look at this image of Max popping out of the cake surrounded by monsters, it makes you smile. It makes you happy. And that's the experience I want people to have working with Heritage. You know, I feel like I forgot to mention the fact that the Peel comes from a very, very, very significant collection, the Melvin Pete Mark collection. The Holy Grail. Which is oh, also uh, uh, part of an American, which is an American history auction that is upcoming as well. That's right. That sale will take place May 7th, so right. we'll be on view a little bit together. One of the sales. great American historical if not the greatest. Artifact collector. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, and he was one of the founding members of the Portland Museum of Art. I mean, mm -hmm. he is, P. Mark, everybody knows who he was. He, we revere him for what he's done as a collector, for his eye, and for what he's done for our country. Right. So, I was so excited when our colleague Joe told us that this work was coming in, and uh, yes, I agree. I mean, it's a natural fit for heritage. We've set an auction record for a portal portrait of Rembrandt Peel. We set that about nine years ago. We sold yeah. one for over $600,000, and this is the right time to try it again. I'd like to beat our own record with this picture. Would you expect that, given the state of the market these days, that that's a, a fairly easy expectation to reach? Well, I mean, I set very high expect, unrealistically high expectations for myself every season, and I work my ass off part of my language to get that done. And so far they're it's all, happened. They're all terribly offended. All the people <laughs> watching on YouTube can't believe I, it. You can take the girl out of New York, but the gutter mouth comes oh, with me. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Shameful. I know. It's a Shonda. It, it's a Shonda, exactly, exactly. So we should do a, a, a Jewish illustration section in the next one also. Well, I mean, it's, again, who's the we here? It's all you, Holmes. <laughs> we should take this act it's on the road. all you, Holmes. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I, of course, I, I really want our, our client base to understand all of this. So of course, you know, Pete Mark's portrait of Rembrandt Peel should be in a museum. It's a museum quality picture. 
it, it, it could go to a museum. It very well could go to a museum. I, it, that would be wonderful if it goes back there. But, you know, provenance is key here. It, it, obviously, it's, it's in remarkably good condition. It was painted in 1855. It has exceptional history. And it comes from his collection. So you're right. buying a bit of greatness. You're buying a bit of Pete Mark of his collection when you buy this painting. Before we wrap up, I do want to talk about what's behind us because I'm fast. San Zane, look, I don't think I knew much about Burger San Zane before I came to Heritage a couple of years ago, but I know that San Zane is having a moment at the moment. He sure is, and that's all due to Heritage. Before I came here, I never had such a track record selling San Zane. And now we hold not only the auction record, over $600,000, we hold the second highest price as well. People in the Southwest love San Zane. He's often been compared to Van Gogh. He's sort of the American Van Gogh in the way he paints, that thick, luscious brushwork, that staccatoed colors, jubilant, bright, jewel co uh, tone colors of thoroughly American landscapes, you know, in Colorado sure. and Arkansas. And so he's very unique to the American scene. He's the only artist where we could, beside maybe Leroy Neiman, Norman Rockwell, and Leindecker so far that we could put 10 in a sale and they will all sell within or above ex right. estimate without fail. So we are giving our audience what they want. I try to really keep these sales very, very well curated. The sale only has 150 lots in it. Mm -hmm. I could have gone further, but I really, after the success of our last year where we rocked American art, where we sold over $25 million in American art and set so many records and the world is watching, I intentionally kept this as a jewel of a sale to yeah. say, wait, You've seen what we could do with illustration in Western. Look what else we can do. I see you brought a slice of New York with you here to Texas. Yes, I did. Of course. And G. Harvey is such a, te a Texas guy, uh -huh. you know. He's the Mac Daddy of Texas art, obviously. That was what, how he was well known. It's as his, Mac his Daddy Wikipedia Daddy. page, yes. right, exactly. Yes. But people don't realize that he also painted New York scenes. That's right. And this is lovely. You know, this is the kind of picture that will appeal. The estimate is 40 to 60,000. Again, we talk about this. I really try to bring quality art to our, our client base, you know, at every price point from 5,000 up into the millions. Right here, 40 to 60,000. This is going to appeal to our Texas clients. It's going to appeal to our New York collecting clients. And it's going to appeal to anyone who just loves beautiful painting. Right. So um, we, we actually put that even though it's a New York scene, it's in the Western section of our catalog because it's mostly Western buyers. And for speaking of things I kind of fell in love with that I didn't really know anything about, the piece over my shoulder. I feel like I'm looking out the window every time I look at that piece. I know, it's, Ed Mel, he's so good. It's really a stunning piece. He is piece. so good. I urge all of you to look at the catalog. We printed the front cover. We did a detail of another Ed Mel in the cell. He's, what a modernist. I mean, he paints in such a unique way. You know a Mel when you see it from across right. the room. You know, the way he does this sort of flattened, um, modern, overly simplified facets of mountains and clouds and sky where it almost becomes one plane right where you still feel the depth and you understand that it's america but it's painted in such a thoroughly modern way love ed mel from a distance it's very three-dimensional yes it is and as you get close you you know go into small little details right. every little vignette is its own beautiful little modern masterpiece yeah i've really become very enamored of this piece i agree and they're they're still at a very affordable price points yeah i mean that's the thing that's why i wanted to display these pieces because they are affordable, because they are recognizable in some way. You and I talked about this the other day, about the fact that many people identify American art as being a lot of landscapes. Yes. It's the rugged west. That's it's right. the beautiful streams. It's the, the vicious and vibrant and violent oceans. But, you know, I, I, Sanzen, as we were talking about, is certainly sort of the master of that. I know. This Ed Mel really kind of changed my perception. It gets you, right? Yeah. I know. I also have this sort of emotional reaction to it. Yeah, so I'm sure. actually happy you hang these too. Well, you know. A little change. I do what I can do. You do what you can do. All right, look, this is uh, May 10th, the American Art Signature Auction, and another extraordinary event to anticipate. Always a delight to talk to you about these things. Always a delight. If uh, folks who are watching here want to get in touch with you as we're watching on YouTube, tell them how to do that. So you can all reach out to me on email at avival at ha.com or you can call me directly. I would love to speak with all of you. 212-486-3530. Am I gonna regret that? Saying I wanna to talk to everybody? No. I love you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure.